Good afternoon. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm director of education at the National First Ladies Library, located at the National First Ladies Historic Site in Canton, Ohio. I am so excited to welcome you to today's Legacy Lecture. We are streaming on Zoom and live on Facebook today. So if you aren't able to access the talk um, now, you are welcome to return to it later, um, either on Zoom or YouTube or Facebook. Uh, before we get started, I want to encourage you, if you have questions, to enter them on the chat on Zoom or Facebook, which we are moder moderating. Um, I also want to mention a few upcoming programs here at the National First Ladies Library. We have an ongoing summer First Lady kit for kids, um, which you can order via Eventbrite. Um, all of the kits that we've done this summer uh, are now available for order. They come with really fun illustrated um, seed packets. Uh, there's an Eleanor kit that involves canning, a Michelle Obama Amazing Race, and a Lady Bird Johnson um, seed ball wildflower growing kit. So we're really excited about that. My other hope is that you will join us next week, August 10th, for um, a virtual tour inspired by our monthly program with Stark Library. We are going to be watching um, the RBG documentary. And whether you're watching it for the first time or re-watching it um, with the new lens of this field trip experience that we're going on, we will be um, traveling to the Malt Museum in Cleveland virtually for a tour of the um, Notorious RBG exhibition. We're super excited about it. That one is not a recorded event. So it's happening August 10th at noon. We also have an upcoming curator series event um, called Soldiers in Skirts, How to Join the WAAC During the World War II. Um, that's August 19th with our um, director of collections and um, resident curator, uh, Michelle Gullion. We're super excited to share items from our collection virtually with you. We also have a book club program, Eleanor by David McCullis is our book. And there's still time to read it. It's a great book. It's really accessible for a big fat biography. August 23rd, we're meeting up. You can access that however you like through your local library via audiobook. Um, and we'll come back together August 23rd at 6 p.m. to discuss the book. We also, if you are local to us in the Northeast Ohio area, are going to be hosting an in-person event. Crafting with the First Ladies will be doing a tie-on pocket workshop on September 25th. Um, the, the location is to be announced, but it is a small in-person class with social distancing protocols. So we're super excited about that. We've done a painting class before inspired by First Ladies. So we're hoping to get our craft activities up and going in person. Um, and when we can, offering some virtual components of that experience too. So if you're not local to us, please look out for those opportunities. Um, we also have three really great exhibitions at the um, First Ladies Historic Site, one of which is First Ladies in their first 100 days. So if you are local, please join us, or if you're still planning a last minute summer vacation and you find yourself driving nearby Canton, um, please stop in to say hello to us. Um, I've gotten to meet some of our virtual attendees from around the country, and that has been really fun in person. So I've been excited to see people coming through the space and would love to see you. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our speaker today. We're really excited to have Sarah Fisher with us. She joined the International Women's Air and Space Museum as executive director in November 2020. Prior to her arrival, she ran of one of only two history-focused AmeriCorps programs in the country. 
She previously worked as the curator and collections manager at the Lakewood Historical Society, served as an AmeriCorps member with the Quaker Heritage Center in Wilmington College and the Oberlin Heritage Center. In addition, she served as AmeriCorps manager and local history services coordinator at Ohio History Connection and community and operations manager at CoWork Oberlin. She earned a BA in history with a women and gender studies certificate from Ohio University and an MA in history concentrating in public history from Wright State University. One of her pet research interests are the Night Witches, the nickname given to the all-female 588th Night Bomber Regiment at the of the Soviet Union during World War II. So we're excited to um, hear from Sarah today and have her talk about um, that as well as the museum. So thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us and I'll be moderating for questions. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting us uh, from the International Women's Air and Space Museum uh, to your program today. We're very excited to, to partner with uh, one of only a small handful of female uh, historical organizations as well uh, throughout the state of Ohio. So we're very fortunate to be here. Uh, so today we're going to touch on the history of women in uh, air and space. So uh, to kind of get started, who who is the International Women's Air and Space Museum? We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization located in downtown Cleveland, Ohio, inside Bark Lakefront Airport. So that's where I am currently uh, today. So if you do hear some background noise, we are an active airport where we have folks flying in and out here. Uh, but we are right along the lakeshore, just a stone's throw from the Great Lakes Science Center and our friends at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But the mission of the International Women's Air and Space Museum is to collect, preserve, and showcase the history and culture of women in all areas of aviation and aerospace. Educate people of the world about their contributions and inspire future generations by bringing that history to life. So it can really be boiled down to we preserve, we educate, and we inspire. So we are the only museum of its kind uh, in the world dedicated to international women as well as women in all areas of aviation and aerospace. So here you don't have to be a pilot. You don't have to be just an astronaut. You could be an engineer, you can be a mechanic, you can be a flight traffic controller. And that's really what we seek to, to preserve and share those stories. So we're very fortunate to call Cleveland and Northeast Ohio home. We began actually 45 years ago this year. So we are celebrating our 45th anniversary in 2021, we began down in Centerville, so outside of Dayton, Ohio, the birthplace of aviation, where we opened our first museum actually in 1986. And we quickly realized that we had outgrown that space, which is, you know, challenging, it's scary, but it's also exhilarating. And that is when in 1998, we actually relocated from Centerville here to Cleveland, where we have been ever since. So here at the, here at the museum, we have exhibits on Amelia Earhart. We have exhibits on Bessie Coleman, the first African-American woman to earn her pilot's license. We also have one of our newer exhibits celebrating the 20th uh, anniversary of continuous habitation on the International Space Station. So there have been over 200 people from 19 countries to temporarily call the space station home, but only 39 of those 200 have been women. So we are shining a light on all of them and their experiences. We have an exhibit on the Mercury 13. So we're going to learn about the Mercury 13 and some Ohio connections uh, as well uh, during today's program. We also have an exhibit on the WASP, so the Women Air Force Service Pilots during World War II, as well as, um, you know, Margaret Hurlbert, who uh, was a native of Painesville, and Ruth Flusher, uh, just to name a few. We have both physical displays, but we actually, on June 30th of this year, launched our first virtual exhibit, which is located, uh, you can find that on our website uh, under our uh, research and learn and exhibits page. So we were fortunate to have two AmeriCorps members who are part of the Ohio History Service Corps help us research, curate, and develop the, the virtual exhibit 
that shines a light on even more women. Because like many museums, we are limited on space, but we have so many collections, so many stories that we want to that we want to share to have that fuller understanding of who we are and where we've come from. So I encourage you to check that out. At the end of the presentation, we will have uh, our our website address that I encourage you to go and take a look at. And I'm happy to, at the end, put it into the chat box where you can find that virtual exhibit. Our offices are open uh, seven days a week. Uh, our exhibits are open, excuse me, seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Since we are located inside a public building that we share with two flight schools, uh, some of the offices of the Cleveland Division of Police, Ultimate Air Shuttle, as well as an architecture firm uh, that is that is upstairs here at the airport. But our offices are open for gift shop, for research, for uh, tours, things like that, uh, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We uh, care for over 20,000 collections items and artifacts and over 6,000 biographies of women uh, around the world. So I, I like to joke that we are one of those best kept secrets of, of Cleveland, but there's just so much to learn. So we're very excited to partner with uh, the National First Ladies Library uh, today and others. We host a variety of events and programs as well throughout the year. Since January 2021, we've actually hosted a number of virtual programs, and we are going to be continuing those along as we cycle back in uh, some of our in-person opportunities for folks uh, safely. So uh, this is unfortunately one of my repurposed <laughs> slides, but uh, last week we actually did a history of women in World War II aviation, where we really look at not just the WASP, but we talk about the three all-female bomber regiments of the Soviet Union, which Allison uh, talked about. That's one of my pet research projects. I'm very excited <laughs> about learning more about uh, those remarkable women, but also the ATA, uh, the Air Transport Auxiliary during uh, World War II out of Great Britain. But we have hosted uh, a variety of different programs as well for us to shine a light on those lesser known stories, those untold histories, if you will. You can see here on this slide uh, that we have our Corks on the Concourse event. We are going to bring that back. Uh, it's gonna be on Friday, September 3rd of this year. So, you know, less than a month now. Uh, we were exactly four weeks out yesterday. And this is an event that we are gonna be celebrating our 45th anniversary, our 23rd here in Cleveland. It coincides with the Cleveland National Air Show, which will be coming back. Uh, this year, which we are very excited for. But we also have an opportunity to showcase local Northeast Ohio, North Central Ohio wineries as well. And we'll be offering both in-person and virtual programming. So if you're comfortable coming out in person, we have something for you. If you are not necessarily you know, local here in Cleveland, Northeast Ohio, or you're not comfortable yet going out to, to some in-person events, we have a virtual component for you as well. Happening Friday, September 3rd from 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern. So I have our website here. You can go to that to find out more information. And this slide here, you know, it just kind of regurgitates a little bit of what I was saying before that we have over 20,000 collections items, historic items that range from biographies to textiles. We have a, a parachute dress <laughs> that I'll talk about uh, here, here in a moment. Uh, we have paintings, we have correspondence, so archival records, uh, letters, uh, telegrams, things like that, photos, trophies, and more. And we care for over 6,000 and growing biographies of, of women in all areas of aviation and aerospace. So if we have any questions about that, you know, go ahead, put it into the, into the chat the chat feature either there on, on Facebook or here on Zoom. And I'm happy to circle back uh, there at the end. So without further, further ado, we'll just go ahead and get started. Let's dive in, you know, head first, feet first, just do a cannonball into uh, the history of women in aviation and aerospace. So when we're talking about aviation, something to keep in mind is we're talking about what is happening inside Earth's atmosphere. When we're talking about aerospace, we're talking about space. <laughs> We're talking about outside of Earth's atmosphere. So we are going to touch on the history here. We're going to, we're going to try to see how 
women in air and space ties into these larger historical narratives uh, that really got us to where we are where we are now. So we're just gonna we're gonna get started. I bet most of you have never heard of Elizabeth Tibble or Jean Le Brosse. Uh, so to begin, it's very important to understand that fascination with air travel with lighter than air is not something that's just 20th to 21st century. Uh, we have as far back as uh, the 18th century in the 1700s, late 1700s, um, uh, an account of Elizabeth Tibble becoming the first woman in a lighter than air activity um, as far back as 1784. It's important to know because this was before the Industrial Revolution. This was, you know, when the U.S. was still was still a very small idea that was figuring out its footing. But with Elizabeth Tibble, we see 1784. But there's another account in uh, 1776 of a woman, Sophie, Bl Sophie Blanchard of France, who was one account is that she was the first woman to pilot an air balloon. And at the time, we weren't using hot air that we associate now with uh, air balloon festivals, right? They were using a different type of gas. But she, uh, Sophie Blanchard, actually befriended Napoleon Bonaparte, who tasked her with figuring out how to invade Great Britain by air, by balloon, in seven in uh, the early uh, 1800s, early 19th century. So there, there are some conflicting events uh, accounts there, but it's also important to note again this was before the Industrial Revolution, and it was actually uh, it was actually before Ada Lovelace was actually born in 1815, who was considered the first human female computer. Uh, we also have in 1798, Jean Lebras, who was the first woman to solo a balloon. Again, there are conflicting accounts, but it's also we weren't as global of a society. There wasn't as uh, readily at your finger fingertips uh, uh, news and accounts and things like that. But you can see that women from the very onset were involved in the history of aviation. Looking ahead to, to put this into context, the American Civil War, we had what was called the Balloon Corps, uh, where the Union Army had spies who were sp spying in a balloon on the Confederate Army at the, the Peninsula Campaign, uh, Island Number 10, the Savannah Campaign, as well as the Battle for Chancellorsville. So we start to see we start to see a trend. We start to see more mechanization, more wider wider use of you know lighter than air of balloons. We haven't gotten to the we haven't gotten yet to gliders. We haven't yet gotten to our modern aircraft that we associate with the Wright brothers. Um, but in 1880, uh, Mary Myers actually became the first American woman to solo a balloon. And by 1903, in the Wright Brothers experiments, Samuel Langley, who was then the uh, secretary of the Smithsonian, had received $100,000 from the War Department to actually run similar experiments as the Wright Brothers. Um, but however, the history of aeronautical advances really took off during uh, the 19 teens, uh, especially during World War I, which is widely considered the first modern war, where we saw advances in medicine. We saw the introduction of tanks, the last real use of horses uh, and cavalry. We see the introduction of the machine gun, but we also see the introduction and in use of airplanes during the war. And even under Tsar Nicholas of Imperial Russia, he had women flying during World War I. So this is a means to try to like understand where, where we are and where we've come from. But women were involved, like I said, from the outset. And you know, we can't really start understanding this modern, this modern uh, age of aviation without knowing the Wright brothers. You all know Orb and Will. Ohio boys from, from Dayton ran a bicycle shop. Well, they had a little sister. So Catherine was the fifth child of Bishop Milton Wright. She was uh, the youngest of all five children. And she was only three years younger than, than Orville. So they were very close. They had a very strong bond and relationship. But why do we start with Catherine? 
Catherine was never a pilot. But again, here at the museum, it's important to understand that you don't just have to be a pilot to have a part in history. Just like if you're working at a NASA Glenn Research Center, you don't have to be an engineer to work for NASA. There are other areas that you can that you can work. So we talk about Catherine because she was the only child uh, in the in the right family to earn a college degree. She graduated from Oberlin College over in Lorain County in 1898. She was the only child, like I said, to hold a college degree, but she became a teacher. After graduation, she moved back to Dayton where she taught Latin at Steele High School. And when her brothers in 1903 were in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, she and one of her older brothers, Lauren, were running the bicycle shop. And Catherine was involved in research as well with her brothers. So when it got to the point that Orville was pursuing patents and there were patent disputes based on the new invention that he and, and Wilbur created, Catherine was helping to do that research to develop the arguments for, uh, for those patent disputes. Catherine was among the first women to be a passenger in a plane in 1909 when she was in Europe alongside her brothers. A year before, Orville had been in a horrific plane crash, in a horrific crash that actually killed his passenger, and he was very badly wounded. And Catherine left her teaching job to go care for her brother. Again, they had a very strong bond. And all of this time, Wilbur was, was in Europe. He was doing a tour. He was talking to royalty and other dignitaries in continental, in continental Europe about this new invention. And he wrote back and said, I can't do this by myself. You, you both need to come over here. I'm tired of talking to the press. So Catherine actually went to, went to Europe and served as kind of that makeshift like press secretary and kind of that interme intermediary spokesperson for her brothers. So they could talk about their invention, but you know, it, she was involved with it all. So she, uh, she actually in this dress, uh, in this picture here, it was one that she also wore similar when she met President Taft with her brothers at the right at the White House. She had a hand in in the early aviation, but she herself was also a suffragist. So she was a proponent of women getting the right to vote. She was heavily involved after uh, after the 19th Amendment in 1920 in the League of Women Voters. She also was a member and served uh, in the Dayton Women's Club as well. So she was very civically minded. And as you can see here, she also became an honorary member of the National Aeronautic Association. So again, we can't talk about early aviation and really stress the importance of the fact you don't have to be a pilot to have a part in history without talking about Catherine here. You know, less than, a, less than a decade after Orville and Wilbur's success at Kitty Hawk, uh, and then coming back to, coming back to Dayton uh, and continuing, continuing on in their pursuits, you have Harriet Quimby, who was inspired by, by the Wright brothers and many of the very early pilots. So she actually became the first American woman to earn her pilot's license in 1911. But she, had, but she went to France to get that certificate, to get that licensure. Uh, she traveled uh, with a uh, uh, Moissant, uh, a Moissant group, uh, so a type of aircraft group to Mexico where she became the first woman to actually fly over Mexico City. Uh, Quimby actually purchased a Bellera 50 model plane in France in 1912 and actually began preparations for an English Channel flight. She was the first woman to fly solo across the English Channel. All of this was uh, from 1911 to 1912. She also flew uh, from Dover, England to Harderlow, France, which was about 25 miles uh, south of Calais in April uh, 1912 during that, during that preparation flight for the English Channel crossing. Uh, by July 1st, uh, 1912, at the Harvard-Boston Aviation Meet. So she, Harriet, was a journalist from, from New York, from the, new, the, the lower New England area. Uh, she 
so she was back home. She was at Harvard. She was flying in the Harvard Boston uh, aviation meet, and she actually died in a plane crash at that meet. This was very common, not just for women, but for early early aviators, early pilots in general. It was a new technology. You can you can think now the cars that we drive and all the safety measures that we have to NASCAR because of uh, because of the safety concerns there and the advances in NASCAR that we have applied to our modern. Uh, personal vehicles. So the same two can, uh, comparisons can be drawn to early aviation. But Harriet Quimby here was also one that she she towed that line with the with the gender stereotypes because mentioned that she was a journalist. Well, it was proper for women to wear the long dresses at the time and look presentable. But when you're flying, you need to have free use of your arms and your legs in order to fly and maneuver your aircraft. You can't really do that in an angle length dress. So she actually designed her own flight suit that when she is normally just standing in front of uh, the press, it would look like a skirt. It would button down the front. But when she was ready to fly, it would button down in the front and back and around each leg to form uh, trousers, which you can kind of see in this picture here. So we have a replica on display at the museum, so you can kind of get a, fur, a fuller sense of, of what I'm talking about. But it was, it was something that was unique at the time, but she realized that she had, to, she had to toe that line. Another woman that we highlight at the museum, and uh, she's highlighted in that virtual exhibit that I was telling you about, uh, was the world's first deaf pilot, uh, Nellie Willite. Uh, she was also the first uh, woman to earn her pilot's license in South Dakota. Um, she, she became deaf at the age of two after contracting the measles. And while many people with a disability at that time in the 1920s found themselves outcast in society, she actually persevered um, and, and had unwavering support from, from her father, brothers, and friends. So in 1927, she actually she decided to take uh, flying lessons in secret. She had the support of her friends. She had the support of her of her network, of her of her uh, community. But she still had to take these lessons in secret because it was thought that, you know, she was deaf. She can't fly. But you can't tell her no. <laughs> you couldn't tell her no. Um, after earning her license, uh, her father actually bought her a plane that she named Pard after her father. So that was the nickname that she had for her father and well I became a barnstormer so barnstorming if you've never heard of that term the best way that we can describe it is stunt flying so we have photos in our collections here at the museum of you know someone flying a plane a biplane with people on top of the wings as it's in the air playing tennis or playing catch back and forth it's kind of like an exhibition it, it, it's stunt flying there. Uh, so you'll hear barnstorming come up uh, when we when we talk about Bessie Coleman here in just a just a moment. But Willett performed across the country uh, and was and became known for her aerobatics, her uh, her flower bombing and balloon racing. Uh, during World War II, actually, she served as a flight instructor and after the war uh, became a commercial pilot. So again, she was told no, not just because of her gender, but because of uh, because she was deaf, but you see how she she persevered, and that's really some of those stories that we see a lot here at the here at the museum that have just come out that you, they don't take no for an answer. Um, and despite continued oppression, you know she she had that long and successful career. So this is actually a, a photo or a scan of one of the artifacts, one of the archival materials we have here at the museum, and this is her. This is her license. This is the 1927 license that she earned for herself. And you can uh, you can kind of see that, you know, who her who her instructor was. And here you see Pard, that's the name of her plane. So yet another inspiration. Not sure if many of you have heard of Bessie Coleman, but we we want to share Bessie's story as far and as wide as we can. So Bessie Coleman in uh, 1921, 100 years ago this year, became the first African-American woman to earn her pilot's license. Uh, and she actually did have to, like Harriet Quimby, go to France, but for a few other reasons. 
So in 1920, uh, Bessie was living in Chicago. She was working as a manicurist and was hearing stories of these World War I uh, pilots coming back and telling about their experiences flying. And that inspired her. She wanted to learn to fly. She had this lifelong dream of opening a flight school for her community, for other people of color, because she herself, she was inspired to be a pilot, but she was turned away time and time again by flight schools because she was not only a woman, but she was a woman of color and they refused to provide those lessons to her. But again, she was undeterred. She actually befriended Robert Abbott, who at the time was the editor of the Chicago Defender and said, this is what I wanna do. This is what it will mean to my community. And this is how I will continue to uplift and support uh, our, our community members, our neighbors. He said, this is wonderful. And he financed her actually learning French for a year before she ultimately went to France to get that pilot's license. So she she had those two those two kind of strikes against her. She was a woman and she was also a woman of color, but you know she went to France and got arguably a better flying education because this was post World War One. The U.S. at the time was not investing the same money into bettering and building better, more efficient, bigger planes. But Europe was. European governments were doing that because they saw the usefulness of planes during World War I. So that's something that Bessie was learning on better planes too. Uh, so she actually uh, came back to the United States where she participated in air shows, where she participated in uh, in you know the the Curtis uh, the first U.S. national air show, uh, which took place actually in 1922 in Long Island, and the idea of the air show, if you are familiar with the Cleveland National Air Show, it's one of the longest continuously running air shows in the country, because uh, the idea of an air show came over to the U.S. in 1920, where it found its home here in Cleveland because of what we now know as Cleveland Hopkins airport. It was one of the first modern airports with, you know, the poured uh, runway with grandstands and everything like that. Uh, but uh, Bessie participated as a barnstormer and she participated in shows throughout the American South where she used her growing reputation as an engaging and entertaining pilot to also say that she would not participate in shows that refused to let her her community, her neighbors come in the front gates. So she did die in a plane crash, uh, unfortunately, as like I said, many others did due to a mechanical error. So she died in her thirties, but she continues and continued to inspire those who came after her. She never realized her dream of opening that, that, uh, that flight school, but someone she did inspire, Willa Brown did. And Willa Brown went on to went on to train many of the men who would go on to fly at Tuskegee and became the Tuskegee Airmen uh, during during World War II. So uh, Bessie's legacy lives on. This is the centennial of her getting her her license that we want to shine a light, and we have a permanent exhibit on her at the museum as well. Another name, a woman that needs no introduction, is Amelia Earhart who actually earned her pilot's license a year after Bestie did. Amelia has some ties here to, to Northeast Ohio as well uh, because of, let me get this here, because of the 1929 Women's uh, Transcontinental Air Derby or what became known as the Powder Puff Derby. It took off from Santa Monica, California and landed here in Cleveland, again, we had one of the first modern airports. So it was natural for this cross country race to end here in Cleveland. Louise Thaden actually won that race and Amelia Earhart took seventh. A Clevelander, Northeast Ohio native Blanche Noyes who had earned her pilot's license just one month before, uh, before the actual race which took place in August 29. She bested uh, Amelia and placed fourth here. So Amelia Earhart, we all know her. She was uh, the, the first woman to solo 
across the Atlantic in 1932. Um, and she's also famous because she was one of the founders of the 99s, an international organization of women pilots, which we have our roots in as an organization as well. And also, you know, Amelia did disappear <laughs> in 1937, uh, seeking to, to fly around the world, uh, become the first woman to fly around the world along the equator. She never actualized that dream, uh, but uh, Central Ohio uh, Columbus native Jerry Mock did 30 years later in the 1960s. So again, lots of Ohio connections here. I brought up Blanche Noyes uh, here again. She uh, entered the Powder Puff Derby uh, just one month after finalizing her pilot's license. She started training and taking lessons in February 1929. By July, she had earned her pilot's license. And in August, she took off to participate in the Powder Puff. She went on to become a demonstrations pilot actually for Standard Oil in 1931 and continued flying with other corporations until 1935. And she actually joined the air marketing group of the Bureau of Air Commerce in 1936. And that same year, 1936, she actually joined uh, Louise Theoden who won that, that Powder Puff Derby in 1929 uh, to win the Bendix Trophy race. So another notable race uh, for pilots. Looking internationally as well, it is important to note, like I said, uh, that European countries and even the Russian Tsar, uh, then the Soviet Union, put a lot more emphasis in terms of financial power behind the developments in aviation. Uh, so in 1917, actually, the most was one of the most dramatic precedents for Soviet women in combat uh, was the Women's Battalion of Death. Um, so that was at the tail end of, of the First World War and during the Russian Revolution. Uh, so one of one of the women inspired by the woman who made up the Women's Battalion of Death during uh, during the early Soviet Union was Marina Rushkova, who we have here uh, featured actually in this picture. Uh, she was a famous navigator and pilot in the 1930s and subsequent, subsequently became commander of the first women's military aviation group. In 1934, she began teaching air navigation at the uh, Zhukovsky Air Academy, where she became the first female instructor at the tender age of 22 years old. By 1935, she actually completed the first women's cross-country flight in sports planes, flying from Leningrad to Moscow. In uh, 1939, Soviet women flyers had captured more aviation records than women in any other country. Now we have historically, in the narratives that we learn, focus a lot on the US and the US's uh, involvement in early aviation, but we also have have the Soviet women who Marina Rushkova is along the same lines as Trailblazer um, as a leader in women in aviation as American Jacqueline Cochran. Uh, so in September, we're actually going to welcome a scholar, uh, Dr. Raina Pennington to the museum for our Dinner with a Slice of History uh, program, where we're gonna look at Marina uh, versus Jackie and see how similar yet different they were um, in their leadership there. Uh, so in 1939, also it's important to note that that was, uh, that was the year that's, that World War II started. Uh, the, the Nazis didn't invade uh, the Soviet Union until 1940 uh, with Operation Barbarossa, but uh, in 1939, Marina and two others actually got the blessing of Joseph Stalin or Yusuf Bukashvili uh, and began the first fabled journey uh, for women to fly from Moscow to Komolsk, uh, which is about 6,500 kilometers. They actually ran out of fuel. So this was, the, this was the flight of the Rodina, which is the plane that you see behind them there. And there was a massive worldwide search, if you will, um, in Siberia to find them. All the women survived. And Rashkova actually is credited also with the group that we'll talk about as we get into World War II here and the lasting legacy. So I brought up Jackie Cochran. So at the time of her death in 1980, uh, Jackie Cochran held more speed, altitude, and distance records than any other male or female pilot in aviation history. She was the first woman to break the sound barrier. Uh, Jean Hickson, who, Akron, from Akron, uh, a fifth grade teacher in Akron, 
was the second woman to break the sound barrier and did so over Lake Erie, actually. Uh, but Jackie grew up in, in poverty. We don't know a lot about her, but we know she grew up in, in poverty. She uh, became a beautician at Saks Fifth Avenue in New York. So her storyline kind is kind of comparative uh, to, to Bessie Coleman. Uh, and uh, she, she, married, uh, she married Floyd Oldham and she became a, a pilot. It, she only took like three months <laughs> to, to earn that pilot's license. Um, but she set three major flying records in 1937 and won the prestigious Bendix race in 1938. In 1941, uh, Cochran actually uh, selected a group of women uh, to, to go to the United Kingdom, to go to Great Britain. This was still at the beginning of the war to observe and participate in the ATA, the Air Transport Auxiliary. Uh, and in 1942, Cochrane, at the request of uh, Army General Hap Arnold, actually organized the Women's Flying Training Detachment, so the WFTD, uh, to train civilian women pilots to, in anticipation of a shortage of military men to fly. So the WFTD and uh, the women, uh, the Women Air Fairing Squadron, or the WAPS, who I'll talk about in a second, became known as the WASP. Like I said, Jackie was the first woman to break the sound barrier and shown here is actually Jackie getting uh, into, into the cockpit there with the first man to break the sound barrier, Chuck Yeager. And they had a very strong uh, friendship relationship there as well. So we can talk all about Jackie, but we wanna talk about some other women <laughs> right now just for timing purposes. So the Women Air Force Service Pilots or WASP uh, is the term, is the name given to the WFTD so uh, the group that Jackie founded, uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Women's Flying Training Detachment and the Women Air uh, Fairing Squadron or the WAPS. So Women Air Force Service Pilots, Jackie became the director of all women pilots during World War II. From 1943 to 1944, there were over 1,100 and two women who were trained and flew over 96 million kilometers or 60 million miles, ferrying aircraft, towing targets, and performing other administrative flying duties. Um, the WASP were actually disbanded in 1944, uh, and they were considered in service to the military. They were not active participants uh, that were eligible for the GI Bill or other veterans' uh, benefits until 30 years later in the 1970s, in 1977 to be exact. Uh, this group of women, there were 38 of them who actually died during their service. And one story is that uh, these there was one woman who did die during her service in the WASP and wanted to be buried in Arlington National Cemetery, but was told she was not allowed because, excuse me, uh, because she was not a veteran, she was not part of the military. So her fellow squad uh, members raised funds to, to privately fund that internment there. These women also flew every single military aircraft that the United States had, including the B-29. So if you're, if you're in and around Northeast Ohio and you were here a couple of weeks ago for DOC, um, which is one of only two airworthy uh, B-29 super fortresses uh, still, still around, uh, these women flew those as well. Continuing on with World War II here, uh, I brought up the three all-female bomber regiments of the Soviet Union, of the Red Army. By comparison, during World War II, the Soviet Union was uh, unique in world history because of its large numbers of women in combat. Uh, actually, during both World Wars and uh, the Russian Civil War, women fought on the front lines. They were actually part of the military and there were over 800,000 women in military service representing about 8% of uh, the total Red Army at the time. Uh, so if you look at the WASP, if you look at the ATA, they were not technically part of the military but in the Soviet Union they were. So women uh, who were in the ATA were fired upon but they could not fire back the women uh, who made up the three all-female bomber regiments in the Soviet Union did fire back. And one group, the 588th, was, given, was coined uh, the Noctexan by the Nazis because they flew at night and they just drove them crazy. <laughs> they flew over 23,000 missions, dropping over 3,000 tons of bombs. So 
it's also important to note that these women were not encouraged to be a uh, part of part of the military, but uh, they did fly. They were very successful. Uh, they were very efficient, even while flying secondhand planes, where sometimes the the bomb bays would not actually be operational. So women had to hold, uh, reach out, hold the bombs, and drop them by hand. So that is something to to have that understanding, that more holistic look at World War II here. And we also have uh, we have the Curtis Wright um, Engineering Cadets, or uh, you know we think about the Rosies. Uh, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about that role within aviation history here. Um, but during World War II uh, here in Cleveland, actually we had the Fisher uh, Body Aircraft Plant Number Two, uh, which in the 1950s became known as the Cleveland Tank Factory, which we associate now with the IX Center. Uh, so, but during World War II, they were producing the B-29s. They were manufacturing, uh, they, were, they were building and riveting uh, these, these planes for the war effort. The Curtis Wright cadets uh, were women who were brought in over a course of two years to learn aerodynamics, to learn all these engineering uh, feats. And they were the quality control. They were stationed in Buffalo, Columbus, and Louisville at uh, the Curtis Wright Aircraft Corporation factories as well. So we have a whole program that where we talk about where we talk about that. Um, but really, just for timing purposes, we're not going to really get into get into space here. But we are happy to to come back answer questions here because I do want to allow some time for for all of you to to have some questions. So we can go ahead and and open that up if if we're good to go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm still looking out for questions in the chat, and I think we may have some on Facebook. Um, I wanted to ask you, some of these women, even though I am an Ohioan, I had heard very little about, or with Catherine Wright, I had only heard of her being an Oberlin graduate, um, but what do I, if I want to learn more information about Catherine Wright, where should I go? What should I look for? Are there books about her or some of these other women that you would recommend besides obviously visiting the museum and checking out your virtual programs? Yeah, most definitely. That's a, that is an excellent, that is an excellent question. And we are always happy to encourage, encourage the the learning more and being that inspired to learn more. So we do have uh, we do have some collections at the museum and archives here as well. Uh, if you are wanting to learn more about Catherine, you can always reach out to Wright State University, uh, which has the the Wright family collections and the collections of Bishop Milton Wright, so the father of Orv, uh, Will, and Catherine. Uh, but you can also reach out to Oberlin college their archives and uh overland heritage center as well if you're wanting to learn more uh since Catherine was involved with the league of women voters you can also reach out to the league of women voters of ohio to see you know what their what their chapter uh, institutional archives look like as well we had some questions um in our facebook chat about some of the programs that you had talked about or hinted at that you had done or were doing at the museum, mm -hmm. are those available online? Can our um, viewers access those? So right now we're in the process of relaunching our YouTube channel. So thank you so much for, for your interest in engaging. Uh, all of them have been recorded and uh, this fall, we are going to be relaunching our YouTube channel where you can access those programs as well. So we've we've done uh, the history of the Mercury 13. We have done uh, the, the history of women in World War II aviation, a brief history of the WASP. So a deeper dive, uh, if you will, and you hear the stories, uh, the, the personal uh, oral histories, if you will, of many of those who flew uh, in the WASP during World War II. So, Stay tuned for that. I encourage you to follow us on, on our social media as well. You can sign up for our e-newsletter, which is sent out once a month because we're gonna do a big unveiling uh, this, this fall uh, for our new YouTube. That sounds awesome. I can't wait to check it out. Um, 
Carol Levin, who is one of our program participants, is in the chat telling me about um, some of the Wright Brother related or Wright Catherine Wright related publications, as well as a novel, which I just noticed the Summit County Historical Society had been doing for their book club. So I'm excited to read that. There's also a question in the chat. Did women ever and we, receive- Yeah, and we, do a, we did a deeper dive. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say with Summit County, uh, you know, uh, Leanne, uh, we did a, she and I coordinated a quick program doing a deeper dive into Catherine Wright's uh, history that coincided with their book club um, as well that looked at the Wright sister, that book. Um, there's also a question in the chat. Did women ever receive uh, veteran benefits for the, the um, piloting that they did? Uh, yes. So for, for the, for the WASP, they did receive uh, those veteran benefits, uh, but that wasn't until 1977. So it was about 30 years later. And actually in 2012, the women, many of them posthumously, uh, uh, posthumously earned the Congressional Gold Medal. And we actually have one of those on display uh, for Margaret Hurlbert, who was a Painesville native. What uh, there's a follow up question here too, and and it might overlap with what you were just telling us. But were, what were some of the problems involved that kept service women from getting veteran services until 1977? That's an excellent. That's an excellent question. So when you are looking at when you're looking at World War II, it's also important to note that there were still these these gender stereotypes, these gender barriers. So women could not be active parts of the military. They were not they were not military personnel. They were civilians working for the military. So that barred them from getting the military status and the military benefits once they were disbanded, once their service was done. So you see a lot of that too in some of the thinking. So a part that we didn't get to that I'm happy to talk about later <laughs> um, is women in aerospace. And that's where we talk about the Mercury 13. So if you watch the news, you, you saw that Wally Funk uh, finally got her chance to go to space after 60 years of waiting. She was the youngest participant in the Women in Space program, which was a privately funded, not US government or NASA endorsed sanctioned you know, study to see could women become astronauts. In 1963, John Glenn actually testified in front of Congress. And he, remember, he was the only person in, uh, Mercury thir in, the, in the Mercury program that flew in both World War II and the Korean conflict that John Glenn testified, well, it goes back to our social order. Men are the ones who go to war and fly the planes and come back and build the planes. It's our social order that women are not part of this particular endeavor. So it was also that mindset that women were not active parts of the military here in the US until the 1970s. So then there was that justification for, well, look at, look at these 1,102 women and they didn't get the GI Bill. They were not given the, the other uh, benefits that military active military personnel received because they were civilians in service to the military. Um, I'm really curious about this research related to women in space and that that was privately funded and what kind of future mm -hmm. women have in this space race, which seems um, decidedly male um, besides Jeff Bezos, including a woman and connecting that history. But are you seeing like, women CEOs or wealthy women wanting to um, pursue this? Or is that um, something that is just not a part of their DNA? Well, yeah, and that's, and that's something that, you know, we can, we can do an, an entire program <laughs> on, on as well. So in terms of where here in the US we started, um, you know, just kind of a, a sampling here for the Mercury 13, uh, and beyond here. So the Women in Space program, it was privately funded by Jackie Cochran. Uh, and like I said, it was, not, it was not endorsed, it was not sanctioned by NASA. 
at the time in the 1960s, we are still in that space race. The Soviet Union had set up, sent up uh, Yuri Gagarin. Uh, they had Sputnik up, but we were we were trying to get Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, and John Glenn to space. It was very much NASA was part of that active Cold War and kind of a paramilitary. It's not it's not an accurate term, but it's the best way I can describe it. Entity. So they were part of this is for national security and women. It was it wasn't really in their in their line of sight. They're like, we need to, this is national security and we're not gonna, we're not, not going to endorse it or fund it. So that's where Jackie Cochran came in and she's like, well, I have the money, I'll fund it. There were 25 women who were recruited, 13 of them passed the tests. And these 13 women, oftentimes they were, they were besting the men's results. So Wally Funk actually, who just went to space um, on that New Shepard uh, capsule and rocket just the other week, she started flying when she was 12. She was 21 when uh, she was recruited to begin testing in 1961. She had to have her parents sign a permission slip. She lasted 10 hours in a sensory deprivation tank as part of the test. John Glenn la lasted only four. So these women were regularly besting the men, but it was deemed that, you know, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to invest in this. Like, this is not the time, but you know, the Soviet union then sent up Valentina Tereshkova to space in 1963. It wasn't until 20 years later that we sent up Sally ride. When we see a shift to, when we see a shift to more science-based rather than, you know, part of national security, uh, at, at NASA and the U S government's focus. So now we're looking at it, we're in a new era. You know, we have the Artemis project uh, where we're gonna set the first woman on the moon. We see Beth Moses becoming in 2019, the first female passenger of a commercial crew vehicle. We see uh, Megan MacArthur, a NASA astronaut becoming the first woman to pilot a commercial crew vehicle. So I, and you see even, uh, you know, the women behind putting uh, the Perseverance rover and Ingenuity helicopter on Mars. So I think that we're seeing more doors opening and more recognition of the role that women are playing in leadership roles. Here at NASA's Glenn Research Center, we have uh, Marla Perez Davis, who's the, the head of, of NASA's Glenn Research Center here. So I think that there are more, more opportunities for, for women now, especially because we have NASA, but also uh, these these other private private entities. Okay, this is a crazy question, um, and kind of related. Thinking about women in leadership roles, and um, maybe when Sally Ride went up, there there wasn't this knowledge or awareness. But there is a viral video about Sally Ride being sent to space with one hundred tampons. Have you heard of that or seen that? Is that story true? I I have not heard of that. Um, so okay, I, I cannot the speak. link, Sarah. Yeah, I can I cannot speak to that because I haven't heard of it. Um, okay. but you know, it's one of those things. Sally Ride was was in the same class in 1978 of NASA astronauts alongside Judy Resnick, alongside uh, Catherine Sullivan. Uh, and it's something that they were part of that first class that admitted women and African-Americans as well. And they were all scientists. So it's something that I, I can't recall. I can't remember how long she, her duration flight was um, because we weren't yet at the point of you spend almost, almost a full 365 days. In it was space. five days, I think five days. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so that's something I, I can't, I can't speak to you because I haven't well, heard of. <laughs> um, I'm going to say that's one of the things that, you know, we have, we have collections and things here at the museum too. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have one of our board members who is our resident space expert, uh, who would probably be the, the most appropriate person to answer such a question. <laughs> um, last question for you. And I'm, I won't be a silly one. Um, with so many women represented in your museum and women in leadership roles in aviation now, um, what do you think the future is for women in flight? And do you think that young women are interested and excited? Where do you see things going? Yeah, I think that is something that just to put some 
put some percentages on things because we all know how we all love statistics. Um, I say sarcastically, but of all of the pilots in the world, only 7% are women. And an even smaller percentage are women of color. So this is where, uh, you know, there is growing interest because it's something that like, uh, like Jacqueline Van Ovos, who is the highest ranking woman in uh, the US Air Force, said, you can't be what you can't see, which is also attributed to Sally Ride. So this is where for us here, this is what drives us. This is what drives us to show that you can overcome adversity or you, can, you don't have to just be a pilot um, to, to be interested in aviation. So we, we do that through school programs here at the museum. We do that through sharing, sharing the accomplishments of, of women and especially women of color. Uh, because you know they make up a smaller percentage of of pilots, and we can go even deeper into more statistics with mechanics, with flight traffic controllers, with uh, aerospace engineers. We can we can go on and on, but it's difficult to be what you can't see, and representation matters. So that is where sharing these stories uh, and showing that someone else has started to crack that that glass ceiling, if you will, is really what what drives us to spark that interest to learn more to then further uh, become inspired. Well, Sarah Fisher, th thank you so much for sharing um, you, this time with us today. I'm so excited to uh, check out the museum and some of your programs. And I know our audience is too. So thanks so much for joining us for today's legacy lecture. And um, if you missed part of today's talk, it is streaming on Facebook and it will be on the uh, First Ladies Library YouTube page. So thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. All right, excellent, thank you. Thanks.